Hello folks, welcome back to the Whoop Podcast, where we sit down with the best of the best. I'm your host, Will Ahmed, founder and CEO of Whoop. We're on a mission to unlock human performance. This week's episode, Whoop VP of Performance Science, Principal Scientist, Kristen Holmes, is joined by Lisa Feldman Barrett. Dr. Feldman Barrett is a university distinguished professor of psychology at Northeastern University with appointments at the Massachusetts General Hospital, MGH, one of the best hospitals in the world. For the past five years, Dr. Barrett has been among the top 1% most cited scientists worldwide for her research in psychology and neuroscience, having published over 280 peer-reviewed scientific papers that have been cited more than 92,000 times. It's pretty remarkable. She has also authored two best-selling science books, How Emotions Are Made, The Secret Life of the Brain, and Seven and a Half Lessons About the Brain. Kristen and Dr. Feldman Barrett discuss the core components of emotions, the neurological connection of emotions, how to understand and interpret emotions, and all the findings and teachings of Dr. Feldman Barrett's two best-selling books. That's right, this podcast is hitting emotions. If you have a question you want to answered on the podcast, email us podcast.com. Call us 508-443-4952. Without further ado, here are Kristen Holmes and Dr. Lisa Feldman Barrett. Dr. Lisa Feldman Barrett has been among the top 1% most cited scientists worldwide for her research in psychology and neuroscience. She has testified before the U.S. Congress, is the chief science officer for the Center for Law, Brain and Behavior at Mass General Hospital, has served as president of the Association for Psychological Science, co-founded the Society for Effective Science, and actively engages in informal science education for the public via popular books, articles, and public lectures. Lisa's TED Talk has been viewed more than 7 million times to date. Colleagues have called Dr. Feldman Barrett the most important, affective scientist of our time, and the deepest thinker on the nature of emotion since Darwin. Dr. Feldman Barrett, warmest welcome to the Whoop podcast. Thank you so much for having me on the podcast, Kristen. I'm so excited for this conversation. And I think, you know, our listeners are, are really into living a healthier and more meaningful life. And I, and I think the research that you've done in the realm of emotion science provides this insanely compelling argument that if if we as individuals improve our understanding of how the brain and body develops and processes emotions, we can in fact live a healthier and more meaningful life. And I can't wait to dig into the work that you've done to just help us understand what these processes are and how we can think about them to make more accurate, meaningful associations in our, in our life. And, and a lot of, I think, the assumptions that we've made about emotions are just are flat out wrong. So maybe we can start, you're starting your PhD, you have this intention to be a psychotherapist, but all of a sudden there's this kind of grand pivot. Maybe you can take us back to that and, and then we can kind of get into, you know, the, the, the brain and, and just kind of create this foundation for, for a, a conversation around emotion. Sure, sure. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, you could talk about my education as sort of one long, actually even my career is sort of one long educational experience. So you know, my original intention, even before graduate school, was to go to medical school. And I was always really interested in physiology. I really liked anatomy. Actually, even as a high schooler, I took like an anatomy class. You know, I, lo- I just really thought the systems of the body were super interesting. A bunch of my friends went to medical school before me, and I watched what they were doing. And I thought, yeah, you know, I don't really like being bossed around. I don't like following other people's orders. I have my own ideas about things. And so uh, I thought that a PhD would be a better route for me. But I still was super interested in the mind. And I thought that, you know, trying to understand how people work kind of holistically was the right way for me to go. And one of the things you do when you go to graduate school is you, you need to do your own research projects, as you know. And in order to demonstrate that you're competent in a laboratory and that you won't hurt anybody terribly, <laughs> um, you have to try to replicate uh, studies that have already been published. And so I attempted to do this eight times. And fa- I had my own little replication crisis. You know, eight times I tried, 
eight times I failed. And by the time I was at the end of my third year in graduate school, so I was, for people who don't, you know, our listeners who don't know, you, you go through, at some point in your graduate education, you go through like a series of very big tests, mm-hmm. um, usually called comprehensive exams, where at least in my day, people failed. Yeah. Like you could fail and you It was not a leave. foregone conclusion no, that you're going to pass these no, things. No, yeah. not at all. <laughs> So I was writing comprehensive exams at the same time as trying to figure out what I was going to do. And my advisor left. I mean, it was just this, you know, she went to another university. So my life was basically falling apart and I was getting divorced. So it was like just this, I got married very young, whatever. Anyways, my life was falling apart. What I did was I went back and I looked really closely at the data that I did have from eight studies (laughs) and um, realized that actually I was replicating an, uh, an observation again and again and again. So I was replicating myself. And I, what I right. was finding was that people were not distinguishing between feelings of sadness and depression and feelings of anxiety and fear. Mm. And I'm not talking about clinical depression here. I'm talking about reports of feeling right. depressed. Just feeling low. Feeling and, low yeah. and, and distressed, mm. basically. And I thought, oh, well, the problem here is that the measures of emotion that I'm using are are not working and everybody knows. So you that, are wrong. They were wrong. <laughs> yeah. I thought, well, everyone knows. Everyone's, I, you know, remember reading in my textbooks that, you know, what I would now call an emotion category, mm. like anger or sadness or fear, these categories have distinct expressions. Mm. They have distinct physical manifestations. They have, you know, the idea would be that they have their own distinct circuits. and it seemed to me that the obvious uh, path to take would be to just measure emotions objectively rather than asking people how they felt and that that would be the solution to the problem. And maybe I might even discover, you know, why it is that some people are unable to distinguish these clearly distinguishable states. That was my kind of operating premise. I thought this would take me like four months. You know, like I would just, you know, learn to measure people's faces and bodies. And then I. And that's just always like the classic naive, like, oh, yeah, this is going to take me four months. And then four years later. No. Yeah. Like, well, 30 years <laughs> yeah, later. 30 years. I mean, also, so, you know, so it ended up becoming really my career, actually, because what I discovered really systematically. So I had to retrain, you know, to learn how to measure facial movements, for example. And I thought, well, you know, everyone knows that Darwin said that, you know, that people scowl in anger yeah. and they smile in happiness and they frown in sadness. And these are universal expressions and we share them with other animals and blah, blah, blah. Well, it turns out that it's a little more complicated. And also Darwin was wrong about yeah. that. So Darwin, the book that Darwin wrote on the expression of the emotion in, in men and animals makes certain assumptions that we yeah. now know are are not the case. And believe me, I'm not are we allowed to use salty language here? Yeah. I'm not I'm not shitting on Darwin. <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, On the Origin of Species mm. as a book is a masterpiece, right? I, I don't yeah, think truly. anyone would, would disagree. But also these books were written at a particular time in a particular yeah. place. You have to think of them as historical yeah. sources. And Darwin was wrong yeah. about some of the assumptions he made yeah. were, were wrong. And yeah. it's okay. Great scientists can be wrong about things, you know. Um, so it, because it turns out that people don't, frequently scowl in anger, for example, like, you know, studies now show really clearly that people maybe scowl about 35% of the time when they're angry, which is more than chance. So scowling in anger is one expression of anger, but 65% of the time, on average, people don't scowl when they're angry. They do something else with their face that's meaningful. Yeah. So I was like, okay, well, then I'll have to retrain as a psychophysiologist because, you know, obviously there's no diagnostic signal in the face. I'm not saying faces are meaningless. I'm saying that they're, they're meaning, the meaning of a facial movement as an expression is contextual. Yeah. So more nuanced than very nuanced. And, and, and so obviously uh, for a quick and dirty measure, I'll just measure, you know, the peripheral physiology will, because everyone knows that William James said that mm. there was one pattern of um, uh, physiological change for each mm. emotion. But actually, William James didn't say that. He said exactly what he actually said when he said a pattern, 
a physiological change for an emotion. He meant an instance of emotion. So he was basically wow. saying you could have two instances of anger and they would have very, very different peripheral, they could have very, very different peripheral physiological changes associated with them. That was his actual view. And so anyway, systematically, I just kind of would retrain in a field, mm -hmm. learn about the that field, learn about the the history and the theories and the measures in that field and, and systematically just went looking for these fingerprints or signatures, biomarkers, if you will, for different emotion categories. And it turned out that there aren't any, you know, and then the question became, well, okay, so there's this variation. People, variation is the norm when it comes to emotion. You don't do one thing or feel one thing or look one way when you're sad or when you're happy or when you're angry. So how is it that we what is, you know, what is a brain doing when it's creating emotions? And that really led me to what I think of now as probably the main thrust of my work, which is, so what, how is it, what is a brain and how does it work? Mm. Why do we have brains? Mm. So really, you know, 20 years of research on emotion became the vehicle for me to ask questions, really mm. basic questions about brain structure, brain, brain function, mm. brain evolution, and so on. One thing I learned from you is that brain is not for thinking, which we're going to talk about in a second, but, you know, there's been this classic view of emotions that's been hanging around for like 2000 years. Right. So I just want to know, like in your late twenties, presumably you come to the realization that that viewpoint on emotions is wrong. I just want to understand just the human moment of when you're, you know, back at your apartment or your house and you're brushing your teeth or getting into bed and you're thinking like, I'm going to get some real shit for this. I get, I just don't want to understand. You know what? So I was Th so, Was there a realization I'm, or? No, and there should have mm. been, but there, <laughs> no. And I think I was really naive. So I'll just betray mm. that another example of this naivete. No, I thought, first of all, it, I didn't come to that realization in my 20s. Mm. I, I came to that realization later because mm. when I realized the face wasn't going to give me an objective measure of emotion, I thought I went to the body. And when I realized mm. the body wasn't going to get me that, I went to the brain. Mm. And now, now I'm in my early 30s and I'm retraining as a neuroscientist, which is not a... I mean, training as a psychophysiologist was hard enough, but yeah. retraining as a neuroscientist, that took several years. God. And it was when I had my, um, my child, and that slowed me down a little for many reasons, not the least of which is you can't walk into a scanning bay with a big magnet when you're pregnant. So, yeah. you know, but no, I mean, actually, it was more like I would be saying to my husband, my current husband, not the practice husband who I divorced in graduate school. <laughs> Um, I'd be saying to my husband, I, is this right? Am I like, what is going, what's going, am I, am I completely wrong about this? So no, I think it was more, um, I just wasn't, I just had an open mind and I was curious, yeah. but honestly, I actually thought that people would be excited. Like mm. I love, I wouldn't say I love being wrong. But when someone, when I see a piece of evidence or a paper, a published a peer review paper that violates my intuitions, I just love it. I have a lot of fun with it. There are some things that I've I been- I think that is the core feature of a scientist though, like a true scientist. I don't no? think so. No, no. I, th I don't You're think so. trying to validate your beliefs all the time. <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. I mean, I think- I think science is more complicated as a human endeavor than that. I think yeah. that's the idealization. Yeah. And it's not like I've never, it's not like I've never struggled with being wrong because I certainly have been wrong yeah. about some major things in, yeah. in my work, um, you know, specifically the work, the role of affective feelings like mm -hmm. mood. I mm -hmm. had to really change my views on that yeah. based on the evidence that we were collecting and also that other people were finding as well. But, but I, I guess I would say, no, I actually was sort of taken aback. And let's just say I've learned to appreciate scientists who are willing to actively engage with counterintuitive evidence or even evidence that contradicts their own views. Mm. There are people who, who enthusiastically and with great curiosity engage with such data, but mm. I wouldn't say it's the norm. Yeah. I mean, so I was shocked, actually. I yeah. was shocked at the, and, and I, I also felt, and this is not a conversation about women in science, but mm. I, 
you know, I'm five foot two, I'm kind of, you know, small of stature. And um, I think that all of those things worked against me, including having breasts and a vagina, you know, like, I just think that as a woman, when you come along and say, well, you know, what you guys have been doing actually for a hundred years, totally wrong. That does not make you, you don't win popularity contests that way. That's hard. I mean, that is definitely a whole separate discussion yeah, that it I would love is. to engage yeah. with you on because I, you know, I think it's important. I think we're also in fields where there actually aren't a lot of women, you know, when you look at, at yeah, and, you physiology know, a, and, and neuroscience. For sure. And, yeah. and actually most, I mean, I certainly have trained some wonderful people in my mm-hmm. lab, um, but on average, there are more women who train with me than men. And believe me, I, they're all, all of them are, um, I mentor all of them. I mean, they've, they've watched what ha- what's happened to people who, I'm not certainly not the only one. There have yeah. been a number of us who've been pushing at this question for a long time, yeah. um, but they've watched that happen. And that's, that's the environment that they've grown up in. So they're, mm-hmm. they're very aware going in. Yeah. Um, they're not naive. Yeah. So the brain. So the animal kingdom is made up of just this mind-blowingly array of just super cool brains. Um, what makes the human brain distinctive and why does that matter? Yeah. So it's not the things that you would think, or at Mm. least that, you know, the, the, the sort of the, the myth I would say, or the, Mm. the story that gets told is that what makes the human brain unique is our big juicy cerebral cortex, Mm. right? That wrinkly bit, you know, on that sits like a cap on top of the rest of the brain, um, that it's big. And um, that that is the home of rationality and that that's what makes humans distinct, that Mm. we can think, we can plan, we can engage in very deliberate decision making. And that um, we have this old, ancient, animalistic part of our brain, you know, which is under the cerebral cortex. Mm. That's like your kind of your inner beast, you know, mm. that you carry around with so like you. like the lizard brain. Yeah, like that the we lizard brain to. and the limbic <laughs> system, you know, they're like yeah. you have this inner beast that has to be tamed by rationality, by that big mm. uh, honking cerebral cortex. Mm. And that your brain is like a battleground mm. between instincts and emotions on the one hand and, yeah. you know, rationality on the other hand. Yeah. And they're constantly in battle for control of your behavior. Every executive coach in the in the, sure. the world uses that, and I, sure. we're here to tell them that that is wrong. It is a hundred percent categorically <laughs> okay. incorrect. This is not my evidence, right? Yeah. This is evidence from fifty plus years mm-hmm. of evolutionary biology, mm-hmm. like molecular genetics right. and um, anatomy, and you know, some people who've done absolutely really outstanding work in evolutionary biology. Mm-hmm. There's just too much evidence for us to talk about in mm-hmm. even in a, an mm-hmm. hour mm-hmm. about why that view is wrong. Right. So first of all, our our cerebral cortex, the cerebral cortex of a human brain is not bigger, is about exactly the size it should be for a primate of our size. Mm. It scales, yeah. um, you know, pretty uh, consistently with the rest of the brain for primates mm-hmm. using a primate. I mean, there are differences in proportions when you look at, you know, reptiles versus, you know, mice versus mm-hmm. primates. But as far as primates go, we're pretty typical. Mm. Every mammal has a brain that is built from a common brain plan. This mm. is work by the neuroscientist Barbara Finley. And what mm. she's shown really convincingly is that every mammal has this common brain plan and that where neurons are born during an embryo mm-hmm. uh, formation, um, that neurons are born and they wire up in a pretty typical pattern. And mm-hmm. even after birth, like the brain events, the developmental brain events that happen are pretty consistent across all mammals. Mm-hmm. What changes is the duration of time that you can be in any stage. Mm-hmm. And that's so if you're in a particular stage for longer, more of those neurons are born. And they wire up differently. There's a great saying, brains are like uh, companies. They reorganize as they grow. And so what's happened is that for certain periods of time, certain developmental stages, the human brain is growing for longer. And that gives us 
extra size mm. and extra connectivity. So what really marks a human brain as different, say from even a chimpanzee brain, mm. is there's much more connectivity, which allows um, for um, additional signal processing. It allows mm. us to do certain things with our brains that chimps can't do. And also, because we're just physically large animals, we have physically large cerebral cortex. Mm. That extra space um, allows us to compress and summarize information and signals that in the brain in a more abstract way than other animals can. And so it's really, we have the same brain plan, the same computations are made. It's just, we can kind of do more with them. Mm. And I just want to say, chimpanzees can do things we can't do. Mm. So whereas we can go beyond the sensory and motor similarities between things. So if you, um, you take three apples and you know they all are round and they all have a similar color and they all have a similar flavor and you know we would summarize that into apple and what can you do with an apple well you can eat it but you could also throw it at someone as a weapon <laughs> you could poison someone with it you could right we can abstract away from the sensory motor particulars mm. and we can see commonalities in in the functions that we use objects for mm. right Chimps don't do that, but what they can do is if you put three apples in front of them and then you take them away, you bring one back, they can tell you which one it was. You know, like they wow. have, they can really focus wow. in on details, yeah. whereas we lose the details because we're abstracting away from them. So right. when I say these, this is what and makes And how does it, that serve us? Well, if, if you, you know. look at what chimpanzees do, they have to, they're foraging in the forest for food. They right. have to know how is this tree different from that tree? Mm. We impose functions on things that they weren't designed to have by mm -hmm. nature and then we agree on them and then they have those functions mm -hmm. so for example money right we little pieces of paper we all agree that little pieces of paper can be traded for material goods and then poof they they can be mm -hmm. but it you know and we've done this before in in human history we've done it with barley and salt and diamonds, we've done it with big rocks in the ocean. Mm -hmm. We've done it with all kinds of things. So we just, we all agree to impose a function on something and then the thing has that function. Mm. I mean, and we, that's what a government is. That's what a president is. That's what the Supreme Court is. That's what a vote is there. So we use these abstractions and we build things with them. Mm -hmm. We add to our reality. It also means we can take them away. Mm -hmm. You know, if we all didn't agree that uh, little pieces of paper could be traded for material goods, they, they'd lose their value and then they wouldn't. And that's actually how the great crash, you know, mortgage crisis happened. People agreed that mortgages were worth something and then they decided they weren't. Some people decided they weren't and then they yeah. weren't anymore. Yeah. So chimpanzees don't do that. They don't really have the capacity to do it, but they have the capacity to remember specific details about specific objects mm -hmm. in ways that far outstrip anything that a human can do. And I'm mentioning this because I think I'm telling you what is what some of the things that make the human brain distinctive, but it doesn't necessarily mean the human brain is better. Yeah. You know, there are other animals that have amazing capacities that we don't have um, that are just that they're suited to their environment they're suited to their what a uh, ecologist would call mm -hmm. their ecological niche they're yeah. suited to the ecology they live in mm -hmm. and so are we in what ways in your view has modernity working against how our brain has evolved well you know a lot of people have a lot to say about that mm. it's usually phrased as we have this ancient brain plan mm. and um, modern life doesn't jive well with, with this, with this brain plan. And I, a lot of the things that people say, I, th I think are wrong. <laughs> so I don't really like to phrase it that way. Mm -hmm. I would phrase it slightly differently and say, your, your brain's 
from an evolutionary standpoint, your brain's most important job is running the systems of your body. I mean, this is something I've talked about in my books and in my papers that, again, this is not my, uh, it's not my discovery that, that brains, you know, came on the evolutionary scene as bodies got bigger and more complicated. Um, as sensory systems developed and so on. That's other people's research. But to me, it points to a really important insight. And that is the brain's most important job is regulating and coordinating the many, many, many systems of your body. Mm -hmm. And the most important selection pressure, the most important consideration is metabolic efficiency. So it's not that your brain is trying to reduce spending. It's trying to be frugal in its spending. That's mm -hmm. a different idea, right? So there's this notion that um, the brain works by homeostasis, that you have a set point, and if you deviate from that set point, then you know you, you have to bring yourself back. Some things do work by homeostasis, like temperature regulation seems, you know, you can't go outside yeah, certain. Of but mostly the brain doesn't work by homeostasis for a living creature. Mostly it works by what we call allostasis, mm -hmm which means your brain is attempting to predict the needs of the body and it attempts to meet those needs in advance. Mm -hmm. So it's predicting, correcting, predicting, correcting, which is much more metabolically efficient than reacting. And so metabolic efficiency, it turns out, is really important for all kinds of things, including physical health, mental health, mm -hmm. um, your ability to uh, ha have children, to pass your genes on to the next generation. Um, and this is true across the animal kingdom. Metabolic visions need rules. Mm. Okay. So if that's the case, then because, you know, you, you, you have to do things that will cost you resources. So um, the way I, you know, talk about it with a, met a metaphor, basically. I, I should say all metaphors in science are wrong, okay? <laughs> but some of them are useful. Mm -hmm. And so I talk about the brain, you know, running a budget for the body. It's not, oh, yes. it's not budgeting mm -hmm. money, it's budgeting salt, glucose, oxygen, mm -hmm. you know, all the nutrients and, and chemicals that are necessary to keep a body alive to, and for the brain to stay alive um, as a physical organ. And so... Um, you know, just like in a budget, if you're going to have a big expenditure, you want to make sure the money's in the account before you spend so you don't right. run a deficit, right? right. And but because you can make withdrawals, mm -hmm. you can make deposits, you can have savings, mm -hmm. and you can have taxes. Mm -hmm. And so a body budget works very similarly. The brain is always running a budget for the body. It's mm -hmm. attempting to anticipate the needs of the body and meet those needs before they arise. So, for example, dragging your ass out of bed in the morning is an expenditure, mm. right? Um, exercising is an expenditure. Learning something new is an expenditure. Persistent uncertainty mm. is a big expenditure. Mm. Now, some of these expenditures, some of these spendings are like investments for a, a healthier future you. Exercise is a great example, right? You, you exercise, you spend a lot of energy, but what's happening is the brain is conditioning itself and the body to snap back into shape after you expend the, that energy, as long as you replenish what you spent, or maybe even make some deposits before you, you know, you, you exercise. So you have a drink or you do whatever. When your brain predicts that you're going to have a big metabolic outlay, it tries to make that uh, energy available to the cells that will need it. Mm -hmm. That's what cortisol does. So cortisol is not a stress hormone. Cortisol mm -hmm. is a hormone that gets glucose into your blood quickly so that and conditions your cells to, to take up that glucose so to use it, um, translate it into, uh, into ATP, right. you know, for, for use. Gosh, that's talked about incorrectly. <laughs> Cortisol, yeah, you know, for sure. All, yeah. Now, so what is stress? Stress is just any moment where your brain believes mm. that there's a big metabolic outlay right. that's going to, right? So as you wake up in the morning, before you get out of bed, you have a cortisol surge. Mm. Before you hit the gym, you have a cortisol surge, mm -hmm. right? 
But there are other times, remember, think about what are the things that are expensive in, for a brain? Physical movement, you move your body. You learn something new, that's metabolically expensive. Persistent uncertainty, mm. very expensive. Yeah. So what is modern life? Modern life is a bunch of withdrawals, not enough deposits, mm -hmm. a bunch of taxes, and sometimes savings, but not as much as, as you might think. Or need. Or need. Mm -hmm. And why do I say this? Because, first of all, what is the biggest source of uncertainty in a person's life? Another person, pretty much. Mm -hmm. Like, we live in a world... We have orchestrated, modern life is filled with expensive uncertainties. Mm -hmm. Other people can create savings in your body budget, but they can also create taxes. Mm -hmm. If you eat a meal within two hours of engaging in a stressful interaction with someone, so this is where your brain is predicting that something metabolically taxing is going to happen, mm -hmm. and you do this within a two hour period. Your brain will direct your body to metabolize your food inefficiently to the tune of 104 extra calories. It will be as if you ate a meal that was 104 calories more than what it actually was. Wow. You could be eating exactly the same thing. You will have exercised exactly the same amount. It, it, but if you're within two hours of a meal... If you're, if you have a stressful moment, social yeah. stress from someone else that in an interaction with someone else, it's like adding effectively adding 104 calories to your meal over a year. That's 11 pounds almost. Wow. Yeah. So it's important to remember that, you know, we are the caretakers of each other's body budgets. The best thing for a human body budget is another human. The worst thing for a human body budget is another human. And then add to you that. got to pick your circle wisely. I mean, that is. For sure. Like, no, that's like, like that super, just... it's super important. And then think about all the other sources of uncertainty in, in daily life. Yeah. And that's even before we started talking about COVID or talking mm -hmm. about, right? So the political situation in almost yeah. any country, take your pick. Yeah. Um, Finances, just. Yeah, economics, just economics. Um, climate. Mm. Uh, you know, COVID and other, mm. right? So a lot of uncertainty, persistent uncertainty. Mm. It adds these like tiny little taxes that add up over mm. time to cause metabolic problems. How do metabolic problems manifest themselves? Diabetes, heart disease, depression, anxiety, mm. an increase in the likelihood of some cancers. Yeah. I mean, and the thing is, it's not immediate. It happens slowly over time. Like the, you yeah. know, it's incremental and very slowly over time. So I think if you add to the fact, you just take that and then add to the fact that most people don't get enough sleep. Most yeah. people don't drink enough water. Most people don't eat healthfully. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I don't want to sound like a boring mother. I mean, I am hey. a mother, and sometimes my kid did think I was boring, but preach. <laughs> and, you know, I like French fries and bread as much as the mm. next person, probably more, actually. Yeah. But those are like treats. Yeah. They're not food. Like yeah. you have to, you know, yeah. you, you have to really, um, or at least I had to realize that they're not, you're not putting a deposit in the bank account when you're, no, you're engaging when you're, no. when you're short sleep. Poor nutrition, it, the, yeah. the list goes on. And yeah. I'm not saying this as someone who prioritized sleep my whole life either. I'm sure you didn't either. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think I spent yeah. the first 20 years of my adult life being sleep deprived, honestly. Yeah. I was because, overtrained and, and sleep deprived, yeah. Yeah. Welcome my and, life, yeah. you know, you're, you, we live in a culture mm. where until recently, mm. it was a contest for who could sleep the least. I know. People would know. brag about how, you know, the, yeah. the small number of hours they got and so on and so forth. And I think the point to understand here is that any one of these things by themselves is not going to be a big deal. It's when you add all these little nudges together, mm -hmm. yeah. they they create a big effect mm -hmm. on your brain's ability to regulate your body. And over time, you know, that starts to cause problems. So that's what I mean when I say 
the cultural context we've created for ourselves mm -hmm. is um, not optimal yeah. um, for, for how our brains uh, work. Yeah, it creates this imbalanced body budget, essentially. Yeah, and you know, you, you have to go against the grain of society, really, mm -hmm. you know, to try to get that balance back. Yeah, and I mean, that's really our core mission at WHOOP, is to, to kind of quantify some of these imbalances so people can stay ahead of it. You know, and, and I, I think, you know, so you understand how much training is too much training, how much sleep is too much sleep, you know, how much little, you know, how, you know, finding those the sweet spots of how much time you need to spend in bed. And what are these other factors that, you know, create these imbalances like irregular sleep wake time? And, you know, there's like this kind of laundry list of things that we know are withdrawals. And, um, and I think that's what we really try to surface um, with the coaching on our, on our app, you know, is to kind of help people think a little bit more strategically about some of these imbalances. What's up, folks? If you are enjoying this podcast or if you care about health, performance, fitness, you may really enjoy getting a WHOOP. That's right. You can check out WHOOP at WHOOP.com. It measures everything around sleep, recovery, strain, and you can now sign up for free for 30 days. So you'll literally get the high performance wearable in the mail for free. You get to try it for 30 days, see whether you want to be a member. And that is just at whoop.com. Back to the guests. And I think it's really needed. Yeah. Because, you know, as we've talked about before, your brain is your brain is running a model of your body. That's mm. how it can predict. It's using past experiences to try to make a prediction about what's going to happen next. Right. And because of the way our brains are wired, we're, our brains don't make, you know, our brains don't make themselves aware <laughs> right. of these conditions. Mm -hmm. So uh, you can feel perfectly full of energy, subjectively have the subjective experience of energy, but yet you could be at risk for overtraining, for example, right. or, you know, just, just, just on Friday, actually, I was on the treadmill, you know, trying, it was too cold for me to go outside. So I thought, I'm just going to get my miles in on my treadmill. Mm. And um, I really did. I felt exhausted. But I was thinking to myself, no, this is a subjective experience. You have enough energy to do this. Like you've been sitting on your ass all day. You have enough energy to do this. Ignore your affect, like just mm. keep going. And, you know, I did it and it was fine. But I think that the thing is that yeah, I know how the brain works more or less, but my best yeah. guess, uh, but I still have feelings and those feelings still can give me wrong information. So mm. actually having metrics can be super helpful Yeah, and actually yeah. might even over time, who knows, like actually help your brain uh, calibrate better. Yeah. Because yeah. how we feel isn't always accurate. Well, I guess the way, yeah, but so the way I would say it is the following, that your brain is always regulating your body. Mm. Your body's always sending signals back to your brain. Yeah. But you don't, exp your brain doesn't make itself aware of those signals right. in the same way that we see with very, a lot of detail. So, mm. you know, we see with a lot of detail, we hear with a lot of detail, our skin has a lot of sensory detail. If you think about vision as kind of high definition color TV, mm. then the brain's ability to sense the specific uh, changes in the body, it's more like a black and white 1950s TV with a bent, you know, antenna in the mm. rain. <laughs> I mean, if you actually, we just wrote, we just published this paper actually on the structure of the vagus nerve, which is the largest, oh, wow. you know, nerve that brings sensory signals from the interior of the body to the brain and the structure of the vagus nerve, it's really clear that it's not bringing really detailed, specific information about the state of the interior of the body. It's, it's a little bit, it's not like there's no map of the body. It's just like super vague, like North, South, East, West. Wow. And maybe there are signals you know, about is there pressure? Is it glucose? Those mm. are preserved pretty well, but it's not giving really specific information. That information is already being integrated in the vagus before the information ever hits the brain. So what you experience, you experience your metabolic state as what 
scientists call affect or mm. what what people, you know, civilians, as we would call mm-hmm. them, um, call mood. Mm. You feel pleasant. You feel unpleasant. You feel worked up. You feel calm. You feel like everything's okay. You feel like doom is around the corner. Mm. You feel comfortable. You feel uncomfortable. These These simple feelings are tied to your metabolic state and or what your brain believes to be your metabolic state, right. I should say. Right. Which then informs your budget. Exactly. So there are a couple of things that are important about this. One is that it's a general summary mm. of what's going on. It doesn't actually tell you. And that manifests in the vagus nerve as a general yeah. summary. So you don't really know. Well, you might know, like, is it in above your waist or below yeah, your waist? Yeah. You might, you know, it might be, is it in the interior of an organ or you know, closer to the edge? But you know, the brain doesn't have like a really specific map. So it doesn't mm. actually know um, exactly what's going on. And the other thing that's really interesting too is that your brain is trapped in a dark, silent box yeah. called your skull. And it's receiving these signals. And the signals are the cause of some changes in your body, but your brain doesn't have access to the causes, it only has access to the signals, which are the effects. So it has to try to guess at what the causes are. Right. It doesn't know. And this is what philosophers call an inverse problem or what neuroscientists call a reverse inference problem. So you know the outcome, but you don't know the cause. Right. So the cause is inherently ambiguous and it could be multiple things. So your brain has to guess. Yeah. So your brain's kind of always guessing at what's happening in the body. It doesn't really know. Right. It's got some information. I mean, there's enough information that it can coordinate your heart and your lungs and your gut and all Mm -hmm. the things that it has to coordinate. But it's not so specific as vision. And all you feel is affect. And affect has no information in it other than things things feel okay, things feel like shit. But it doesn't tell you what, who, where, what to do about it. You just don't have any of that. Let's dig into affect a little bit. So there's two features of affect. There's valence and arousal. So maybe kind of talk about those features, why they're important, and how that relates to the predictive mechanisms that you just outlined. Yeah, sure. So the first thing to understand about affect, these mood, basically, it's with you always. Mm. It's not emotion. It's with you always. It's a property of consciousness, really. So it's kind of like if people think about emotion as more of the outcome, whereas affect or, or mood is kind of that like underlying thereness. Like. Yeah, I would say that I would say that um, mood, I don't really think mood is an, an ingredient. I would say that mm. the sensory signals coming from the body that the brain is attempting to model, mm. those are the actual ingredients. Okay. But yeah. we experience those signals as mood. Right. And so those are with you all the time. And they're kind of clues mm. to your the your metabolic state, right? Yeah. So I love that. it means, for example, when you're, when you're feeling like things are pretty good, it means you're probably metabolically probably uh, doing okay. Just, yeah. And when you're feeling pretty miserable, it probably means that you're running yeah. a deficit, uh, yeah. right? Or there's been a big metabolic outlay. Yeah. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean something is wrong in your life. It could mean that you're just doing something really hard. Right. You know, about 20 minute research shows about 20 minutes into exercise, just as people are hitting their um, ventilatory uh, load, you know, like they're 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 starting to build a little lactic acid. Mm -hmm. Right. They start to feel unpleasant. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean something's wrong. Right. Necessarily. It might mean something's wrong, but it doesn't always. It could just mean that you're doing something hard and you need to replenish. Mm -hmm. Right. So. Can I ask a question on that? Mm-hmm. So does your body, when it, as we think about this, you know, body budget, like if I perceive the task as unpleasant, so let's say I'm building that lactic acid and I actually perceive that as pleasant, does that have a different impact on my body budget if yes, I were to then it perceive does. it as yes, yes, ple- it, yes, it does. unpleasant? Yes, it does. Okay, yes, it does. Yes, it does. I think that's so important. See, it's really like, we important. We can talk ourselves into a better future. Is that what Ab- you're saying? Absolutely. It's not, it's not so much like it's, yeah, I mean, it's not exactly Jedi mind tricks. Yeah. But. To a degree. But what, 
one of the things that we haven't really talked about and it's a little complicated to describe in a podcast yeah. without, you know, props and slides yeah. Yeah. is that part of what your brain is doing when it's regulating your body and so on is it's it's creating meaning mm. at the same time. It's not a separate process. Part of what it means to regulate a, a body, to run a body budget is to guess at the meaning of the signals which gives them meaning. So mm. um, I'll, I'll give you an example. You know that, you know that feeling, you know that moment when you're exercising where you're, you're just at the point, of, you're just at the point of enough nausea that you're going to lose your, you're going to toss mm. your cookies. Yeah. You know that feeling? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That feels really not good. Yeah. It's unpleasant. <laughs> it's unpleasant, except my trainer my coach, who I've been working with for 25 years, who, I mean, he, he's just amazing. He once told me, not once, but every time I would get to this point, he would say, uh, the Marines say that, you know, pain is weakness leaving the body. <laughs> or I would say, you know, I would say to him, oh my God, I, I need to get a drink of water. I'm really, I'm really, I'm nauseated. Mm. And he'd be like, great. That's so great that you're, that's the, this is, now you're at the edge of change. <laughs> and I'd be like, what? Except that now, that's amazing. <laughs> when I get to the, you know, now actually, I can't say that I'm always driving myself to get to yeah. that point. Yeah. I'm really, that would be uh, not, that would not be true. But when I'm at that point, I think, don't waste it. Don't waste it. This is change. This is the edge of change. Don't waste it. Don't so waste cool. it. <laughs> so it, it's, even though it feels unpleasant, you know, mm, yeah, it, the meaning of it, the yeah. meaning of it yeah. is, is pleasant. And right. if you think that, that, that that's unusual, I'm not speaking to you. I'm mm. speaking to our listeners. Yeah, yeah. If you think that's unusual. Think about coffee. Most people, when they, the first time they have a cup of coffee. Yeah, it's just not good. They don't like, mm. it's bitter or mm. it's like, it doesn't taste very good. They put so much sugar in to try to, <laughs> but then within like a week or two, they're not even drinking sugar. They'll drink right. it black. They'll right. actually, why is that? Because your brain learns patterns mm. and it's always making meaning of things relative to the state of you know, the anticipated state of the body. Right. So when a when a brain is asking itself, is this good for me or is this bad for me? It's not talking about threat. It's talking about metabolism. Mm. It's not only about metabolism, mm. meaning you can't reduce everything to metabolism because part of what it means to run a metabolism, to run a body budget, is to create meaning. Mm. Signals don't have inherent meaning psychologically. Your brain gives them meaning mm. in the process of regulating your metabolism. Mm. I think it's important for, for folks to understand that we have some control in, in this world of just things that we really can't control, that we actually can make some, we can make meaning out of oh, situations for sure. <clears throat> and, and, and turn them into less expensive moments. Yeah, absolutely. Or you can head into them knowing full well it's going to be an expensive moment right. and prepare. And embrace it. Yeah, and, and embrace it and prepare. So, mm -hmm. for example, if you're feeling really unpleasant, like just really you feel like the world is about to end, mm -hmm. um, it probably means that you're running a metabolic deficit. Mm -hmm. And it. so the first thing I do, I mean, you know, there are times where I come to the end of the day and I just honestly, sometimes I feel like the world is ending. Mm -hmm. I feel like I just, if the, you know, you can't take your your affective glasses yeah. off that you see the world through these glasses. Yeah. So I have to ask myself, am I tired? Yeah. Am I hungry? Am I dehydrated? Right. Is anything really wrong mm. in my life? Yeah. The answer might be yes. Like if I ask myself, well, if I go to bed and I wake up tomorrow, will this feeling still be here? At first, you might not know the answer, but after you keep doing it for a while, you you have some experiences mm -hmm. you, your brain can use to, mm -hmm. to make that prediction. If the answer is yes, then it probably means you, you have a problem that you have to deal with. And if the answer is no, then it means that you just need a little self-care. You need to put right. yourself to bed. You need to wake up tomorrow and it'll right. be a better day. So valence, pleasantness, unpleasantness mm. is really, I think about, well, do you have the spoons? Mm. That's how I sort of think about it. And arousal is really interesting because what arousal is, is directly tied to uncertainty, the amount of uncertainty. 
when your brain can't predict well, it's going to attempt to learn. The simple thing is just if you have an increase in arousal, you feel jittery, you feel worked up, mm -hmm. it probably means there's some uncertainty somewhere. Not always, because you mm -hmm. could be running on a treadmill, you're, you know, you're, yeah. doing, but uncertainty usually goes with arousal, feeling worked up, feeling mm -hmm. jittery, sometimes super alert, sometimes not, but that, that sort of physical feeling of being jangled. Yeah. And our brains automatically make sense of that as anxiety, but mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be anxiety. It could be determination. It could be curiosity. Mm -hmm. It could just be simply uncertainty. Sometimes you need that arousal to get, to get the job done. <laughs> right. Yeah. And there's a, an anecdote that I talk about in, my, in one of my books um, when my daughter, who at the time was 12 years old, and she was testing for her black belt in karate. Wow. And, you know, she was a little thing. She was like barely five feet tall. And she was testing against these hulking adolescent boys, like almost six feet tall. And she had to spar with them. And, you know, I'm sitting in the sideline thinking, oh, my God, what's going to happen? <laughs> and her, you know, her, her sensei, who is a 10th degree black belt. So, I mean, I've said this so many times, but it's true. I mean, like this guy was so... This guy is so powerful, he could break a board by just looking at it. Yeah. Like he's just like, a, he's like really powerful guy. Wow. Walks up to her and he says, not like, don't be worried or yeah. whatever. He just looks at her and he goes, get your butterflies flying in formation. Oh. And I thought, so brilliant. Oh my I've God. That so is good. the most, yeah, it's that's so like, good. that is like the best yeah. Philosophical advice yeah. I've ever heard. I mean, that's really, like coaching at a next level. What uh, he's saying yeah. to her is not calm down. Right. He's saying, this, you're this is your, this, your brain is preparing you yeah. to do something really hard. Yeah. And I want to you hear what I'm saying. I'm not saying your body is preparing you. Right. This is a, in your brain. Yeah. You feel things only in your brain. It's true. You need a body, but you're feeling things in, in your brain. You see in your brain, you hear in your brain, you feel in your brain. If you pinch yourself, you know, it feels to you like you're feeling the pinch on your skin, yeah. but you're not. You're feeling it in your brain. And so it's your brain that is preparing you. Right. And this is the same kind of preparation. Like, I, again, another anecdote I tell sometimes where right before my TED talk, <laughs> I mean, uh, my cardiac output was, I don't even know what it was. I wasn't wearing a monitor, but I could feel my heart beating in my fingertips. Like That's I was, that is intense. It, yeah, I was standing there in the back before I went on thinking, this is determination. This is not anxiety. This is, yeah. you know, I was like, yeah. I'm not worried at all. I'm not, this is not fear. This is determination. But so sometimes it's, you know, it's hard to, mm. to do, but but it was, you know, like yeah. that I was getting, I was really, really on fire, ready yeah, to go. So prepared. <laughs> and sometimes that feels uncomfortable. Mm. It just means you're doing something hard, you know? Yeah. So uh, the, the simple shorthand answer is valence, pleasant, unpleasant. What is your subjective sense of your spoons? Mm. And uh, arousal is how much uncertainty is around. Yeah. I mean, it's a simplification, but mm. it, it'll do for now. I think, you know, your book, Seven and a Half Lessons About the Brain, I mean, it's it's remarkable. Everyone on the planet should read it. <laughs> and, I, and I think it's because it, when I read it, it made me think more deeply about the kind of human I want to be and, and the person I aspire to be. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't make you a wimp. Right. What it makes you is a healthy, it, be, it mm. actually translates, I mean, literally translates into better health yeah. for yourself and for other people. So the whole, I'm, it really pleases me to hear you say that, Kristen, mm. because the whole reason I wrote the book no, it's beautiful. was because I, what I wanted to do was give people a set of little essays that they yeah. could read really quickly, like little bites. It's absolutely amazing. Um, with, you know, some nuggets of neuroscience that mm. people could maybe talk about at dinner parties and like impress their friends. It's so you know? accessible. But, but with, but with deep lessons about mm. how does your brain work? Why does it matter that you know? Mm -hmm. for the kind of person who you are. Like yeah. you have a choice. 
It's not easy mm-hmm. to have that choice. It it it's much harder than uh, we all wish, you know. And some people right. have more choices than others, for sure. Yeah. But we everybody has some choice. Yeah, and it's a it's a worthy pursuit, you know, because it's yeah. going to make our time on this planet more meaningful, yeah. right? Which is, I think, where we started this conversation. You know, is is how do we need to think about our brain and our body in in a, in a way that helps us live a healthier, more meaningful life. And, and you've just given us this really beautiful outline of, of what that needs to look like. On the topic of just emotions specifically, you know, how do you like people to think about emotions? You know, and, and obviously you've written your other book, How Emotions Are Made. Um, this is your first book, which is unbelievable, the, the, the subtext, The Secret Life of the Brain. It's an amazing book. Um, it's dense. It's well, so beautiful. It is, a pop- it is a popular science book, but you know, Seven and a Half Lessons was written more for people who don't think of themselves as being interested in science. Mm. How Emotions Are Made was written for people who like science and yeah. they, they want a popular science book. And so it's, it is, um, you know, it's, it's, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's written it's, for the public, but it's science. It's, totally. It's yeah. definitely, um, definitely science, science heavy. I think the message there, is that you are an architect of your experience. Mm. It might not feel that way to you all the time. It's such a powering lens, you know? (laughs) But you really do have more control Mm. over what you experience than you think you do. Like, and again, I'll say it, not everyone has the same amount, not everyone has the same options. Mm. Not everybody has uh, the same amount of control. Um, none of us have as much control as we would like to have, and right. the control is harder to get than it's it's harder to achieve, but everybody can have more control. Mm-hmm. The flip side is that if you have more control, you also have more responsibility. Mm-hmm. And this is a really important point that I'm about to make. Like you have to be a role model. Well, it's not only that. It is that for mm-hmm. sure. I mean, the concept of karma is really interesting, right? Mm-hmm. Because all of us are, are niche constructors, meaning we, we all, your behavior towards other people is, and towards the environment, towards a- animals, whatever, your, your behavior m- puts things into the world and makes the world different than it was. Yeah. So, you know, there's, so there is that aspect to it of being a role model. But I mean that I'm not saying that you're culpable or to blame if you have negative emotions, but I am saying that sometimes we're responsible for things, not because we're to blame for them, but because we're the only ones who can change them. Oh, that's, yeah. So if you have persistent distress, the ultimate cause may not have anything to do with anything that you're culpable for. Mm. but the only person who can change that distress is you. It's unfair, but that's just how it is. And once you realize that, and you realize that there are tools that you can harness, then you can take back some control. Mm. But you have to own it, right? You have to own it. Yeah. It's I think it's, I think it's empowering. I, it. I, I agree. I I. I, I love to hear someone like you say that, you know, because it puts the ball in our court, you know, and, and that's the only court that we can control yeah. is our own, you know. And, I, you know, and I, I just want to say that I'm I, I've been really heartened by people's response to this message. Like, yeah, a lot of us, everybody has some, you know, tragedy that's happened in their lives. 100%. I'm not saying this as a privileged white person who has lived yeah. an upper middle class life her whole yeah. life and has never faced violence or trauma or anything. Yeah. I, you know, this is just how it is. Right. And it's this way for everyone. Mm. And, you know, some people have more fortune than others. Some people have more choices than others. Like all of that's true. All of that inequity is is absolutely there and mm. it's absolutely true, but everyone has also more opportunity than they think they do. And yeah. by and large, people have found that that message of responsibility does it doesn't equal culpability, right? It doesn't yeah. equal blame. Yeah. People have found that really, really, really empowering. I think that's probably the biggest 
blessing that I've experienced actually in the, you know, seven years since that book has been published, How Emotions Are Made, that people have really found this super useful, you know, in the, I don't know, 22 languages that the book has been translated into, not every, not everywhere, right? But I'm still on a daily basis receiving, I don't know, like a dozen emails a day about this book that is seven years old. That's just, yeah. So beautiful. <laughs> yeah. It's a me. It's a, it's a, it's a, I mean, I'm, I am super grateful. I'm super grateful. Well, the impact you made is just, you know, it, it's, you've really provided us a new you of human nature. Um, so thank you for your courage, bringing the science to the world. And I guess just to finish the conversation, we ask all of our guests what they're obsessing <laughs> over right now. So curious what you're kind of obsessed with right now. I'm obsessed by learning to bake rye bread. Oh, so I'm t- rye bread turns out to be like rye. Dealing with rye is really hard. Mm. So I'm, you know, I'm on a kick to kind of like make. I love bread. Like I love bread. <laughs> so I'm on a kick to make like healthier bread. Yeah. You know, so I like I reverse engineered these bread that won't kill you. <laughs> yeah, I reverse engineered these seed crackers, these Danish seed crackers that you know we had when when we were in Copenhagen a couple of years ago, and I they're really super healthy and they're delicious. So. I'm now like, I'm thinking, well, rye bread, rye bread, you know, maybe there's a way to, you know, so anyways, I'm fascinated by rye bread. I'm currently trying really hard to propagate. I have this ancient, um, I don't know if it's ancient, but it's old blueberry bush. That's like more, it's like an antique blueberry bush. And I'm attempting to propagate it. (laughs) And uh, uh, I tried with cuttings that didn't work. Now I'm trying with seeds. Like I wow. actually, yeah, I saved some. I, How does one acquire an antique blueberry bush? You know, is in the backyard of the, we, so we've lived in Victorian houses and, but we're, you know, we're in Boston. Yeah. So we're, they're just old. Everything's old. Everything's old. Everything's yeah. old. It's really beautiful. <laughs> there was this little gnarly bush, mm. like in the ground, like just, it didn't look like much. And the um, when we moved into this house, this very very old house, the gardener, I guess, who had been the gardener for this house for many years, came and said, "Hi, I'm the gardener for this house. Like, you don't know this, but you bought this house, so now you have to hire me too." We were like, "Okay, oh, that's um, awesome." You know, it has been amazing. But he explained to me that the previous owners kept mowing over this bush, right? So we brought this bush back to life. Brought this book wow. back. Yeah. So it gave us absolutely like the most amazing, tiny little tart, yummy little oh. blueberries in the summer. And my daughter, when she was a little girl, would like pick them. And, you know, anyway, so, so when we moved to our other Victorian house, we took the bush with us. I'm like, I'm not leaving this <laughs> bush. I'm taking it with me. Of course. Um, so now I'm trying to propagate it. So that's, um, mm. that's a bit of a, um, yeah, that's an obsession that's right there. That's an obsession right there. Yeah. And then I think work wise, well, I have a number of obsessions, really whatever it happens to be I'm working on. That's the thing I'm obsessed with. One is, um, one thing though, is that we're actually doing research on brain metabolism in our lab now, which has been super hard to get that set up. But I have this absolutely brilliant scientist, um, young scientist who Mm. has made it, this is going to be, you know, his his, thing. His thing. Wow. And so that's really interesting to actually look at the, the signal processing effects. So in lang- uh, colloquial language, you say, what are the cognitive effects mm. um, or what are the emotional effects of brain metabolism? Like how your, how mm. neurons are metabolizing glucose. Mm. Because there are a number of ways in which it could, you know, there, I'm not going to get into the details, mm. but that's super interesting. And then I'm actually also take, I'm actually also turning my attention to philosophy of science. Interesting. So embedded in this whole uh, framework that we've been, that we've built over 30 years in our lab and that now many, many labs are using Mm. is a philosophy of science, which sounds every time, you know, you say the word philosophy, you say the P word, like philosophy, people's eyes just like roll back. Abstract. Like, yeah. Uh, but, But it's really important questions like, how do you know what's true? Yeah. How do you know what? what to believe like how do you know what evidence you should trust how do your prior beliefs Mm. influence the questions you ask your biases yeah yeah. so it's really about like how do you know what's true how do you know what's real yeah um this is you know a really important question 
important in science. It's important in life. Yeah. And so this is something I'm starting to turn my attention to. I love that. And I'll help us be better scientists, you know, when we understand yeah. how to distinguish and it also will between help, the truth. Yeah. And, but it will also help us read the newspaper better. Yeah, totally. And it will help us talk to each other better. Yeah. And it will help us just be better humans. Well, this has been just such an honor speaking with you. And just can't thank you enough for uh, for being a role model um, oh, for so many of thank us in, in this Pleasure field. Thank you so much. Big thanks to Dr. Lisa Feldman Barrett for joining the show today to help us understand our emotions and how they play a role every day in our body and mind. If you enjoyed this episode of the Whoop Podcast, please leave a rating or review. Check us out on social at Whoop at Will Ahmed. If you have a question you want to see answered on the podcast, email us podcast at whoop.com. Call us 508-443-4952. If you're thinking about joining Whoop, you can literally sign up for free for 30 days. That is at whoop.com. And new members can use the code WILL, W-I-L-L, to get a $60 credit on group accessories. All right, that's a wrap, folks. Thank you all for listening. We'll catch you next week on the Whoop podcast. As always, stay healthy and stay in the green room.